So let, let's see, I just briefly say them here, uh, read them here, and, and see what you <laughs> have to say today about what they th then thought were failings in this declaration. Number one, it creates a false dichotomy. The declaration rhetoric offers a false choice between a wholesale return to our pre-pandemic lives, which is objectively dangerous, versus a total lockdown, which no one advocates. Um, okay, so both both of those elements of, uh, in that in that statement are incorrect. Uh, so first of all, the, the declaration did not call for a wholesale return to, to, to life. What it called for is focused protection of vulnerable people. Of, it, we wanted to take the disease really seriously, and that involves that means that you take the the epidemiology of who's at risk seriously. We were wasting a very large amount of effort restricting the lives of young people, children, uh, closing schools, and so on. Um, and uh, with very little benefit. And then we were also neglecting to, to protect older people. 40% of the deaths in the United States in 2020 and 2021 were in nursing homes. We did not adequately protect older people in nursing homes. In fact, uh, many states, they sent COVID-infected patients back to nursing homes. If Imagine if they, the dec that they embraced the principles of the declaration. You couldn't imagine doing that because you know older people are at high risk. So it's not true that we were calling for a return to normal life without any change, that we we're calling for focused protection. Um, the second part of that statement uh, is, is also incorrect, that, that, that no, nobody was calling for a, a severe lockdown. In fact, if you look around the world, uh, China was. Uh, mm. Australia adopted a, I mean, a, a draconian, draconian lockdown, massive civil liberties violations. Um, so, I mean, and, and Canada also had what I would call a pretty, pretty severe, severe lockdown policies, um, in, up in, uh, including uh, at some point where unvaccinated people were not even allowed to travel within the country. You could see like the, 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 a lot of the reactions were along these lines, trying to diminish the idea that there could be a lockdown. Well, in October 2020, it was really clear to us there was going to be another lockdown. Um, and there was. I mean, like the UK adopted one um, where people weren't allowed to leave their house for more than an hour a day or two hours a day or something. I mean, these were these were dramatic policies um, put in place with a promise to protect us from COVID. Um, and so the, that 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 criticism was wrong on both fronts. Yeah. OK, so number two here is, is a bit of a, a little bit uh, ridiculous, perhaps, but <laughs> we'll I'll read it anyway. The Barrington Declaration gives oxygen to fringe groups. Uh, I'm guilty. I'm a fringe epidemiologist. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. According to Fauci and others. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think the, the, the irony is that the fringe turned out to be correct. You know, fringe, 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 uh, fringe ideas that like the, the, those that Anders Tegnell in, in, the, in Sweden <laughs> turned out to be the right ones. Well, I guess that's how, how, how humanity evolves, isn't it? I mean, the, the people who everybody thinks is crazy in the beginning, when they finally, it turns out that they're right, then things change and, and we can evolve. So, I mean, the funny thing is, Andrews, about that is that um, the GPD is actually the least original thing I've ever written in my life. Yeah. It's, it, it's, there's, nothing, there's nothing new in it. I mean, it's the old pandemic plan. Mm. It is the, it's, the, it's the old, uh, it's how we manage the century of respiratory virus pandemics. Successfully, I might, I might add, the idea is identify who's most vulnerable, develop countermeasures like vaccines and treatments as rapidly as you can, um, to, to engage in, in, in focused protection of those vulnerable people. Don't disrupt the rest of society because disrupting society causes more harm than good. That was the old pandemic plan. Mm. And so you were actually the mainstream and, and the government was the fringe in, in that respect. Yeah, yeah. So again, this—I uh, mean, I was joking about it. I was, I was guilty, for, uh, but you know that, that again, that criticism has it exactly backwards. Mm. Interesting. And number three is the Barrington Declaration puts individual preference far above public good, and and then they make some comparisons with traffic rules. I mean, imagine if uh, everybody should follow traffic rules on an individual basis. You you, you get the you get the point. Okay. So two two responses. One is. Uh, that by itself is not not really a, a, a reason to do or not do something. Uh, I mean, if, if if the individual good serves the collective good, then fine. Um, but but the irony here is that in fact the Great Barrington Declaration was calling for collective action, not individual action. Uh, it, it's the lockdowns with, that were actually individualistic in nature. So like let me let me give you a sense of this. So like the the lockdowns 
not everybody in society has equal capacity to comply with the lockdowns or to because you know societies are tremendously unequal if you uh, if you look at what actually happened a, a, a relatively small class of people i call them the laptop class who could not lose their jobs as a consequence of the lockdown they could work from for, work from home safely they offloaded the risk of the virus to other people who served them Right, someone had to, to grow the food. Someone had to deliver the food to their the, the home. Someone had to make sure the electricity was running. Someone had to make sure the hospitals were going. All of that was uh, was essentially a, a whole class of people working to protect a small group of people who could work from home. That's so with the, the, lock, yeah, the lockdown nature. policy made it with the lockdown policies. The the working class had to bear the brunt of the risk of the virus. Right. Exactly. The working class was was required to, to bear the brunt of the risk of the virus. It's really well put. And indeed, no, it wasn't very much uh, on the table. It wasn't being discussed. But I mean, I think that's been one of the big problems with this whole the way uh, this conversation has gone around coronavirus, and that mm. a lot of things have just not been discussed openly not been debated i've certainly found it very difficult to um uh, put my views out in the in the you know as soon as we we wrote that paper we were met with an avalanche of really quite um you know um serious comments which hmm. not all of which were i mean even though they were from scientists not all of which even were, even from from colleagues of yours you mean? yes which they, they were really quite um harsh i mean they uh dismissed the model and they accused us of being irresponsible because of course there's this sort of sense that going into lockdown is this enormously sort of mm. community well, uh, again. other comparisons aside it's, it's it mm. sounds a little bit like the debate around climate change actually yes it is i think i think the language some is... people say something some some things that's uh, to the effect of the well this is a big problem but maybe it's not the end of the world then they are accused of being uh irresponsible like you say yes i think the language is very similar um you know when you talk about climate change deniers and covid deniers i mean it, it's very interesting i mean that that there's this sense of um authority and and a virtue that's associated with certain positions which has taken i guess the place of religion you know that the whole position is is of uh, towards us that there some of the criticism is very much couched in terms of us being in denial of this enormous threat that is about to sort of enormous problem that's about to befall um you know mankind and that the only to which the only response can be to wear masks and lock down um and to i mean the, the extent that herd immunity has suddenly become this very emotive word i mean it's just mm. a technical concept i mean mm. why is herd immunity the herd immunity crowd <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> What do, you, what, what do you think this reaction comes now? What, what, what do you think this happens now? This extreme uh, reaction to to a to a virus. I mean, we have had so many viruses over the years, and we've had pandemics before. Yes, I, had... I don't quite. I mean, it, it's very interesting how it happened. I mean, if you just look at the history of lockdown and what lockdown means. I mean, because lockdowns, of course, um, initially. I mean, there's several ways in which you can. Um, think about what a lockdown does, and the first thing a lockdown could do is stop a virus from getting out, and that's a, I think, quite a reasonable position to take. And um, as such, I think even in Italy, I mean, certainly in Wuhan, but even in Italy, the initial implementation of lockdown, I felt the language or the the rationale seemed to be, we don't want it to get out of Lombardy, we don't want it to affect all of Europe, which is laudable that's fine you know that that's a very selfless thing to do and then it, the it suddenly turned from being that selfless act to being the selfish act and i will use that word of mm. locking down 
to prevent the virus from getting in, which is mm. not, you know, you can justify it. I'm not saying, you know, obviously national interest can, you know, countries are founded on the basis of national interest. So you could say, look, I'm going to lock my country down because that's, I'm the prime minister and that's what I owe my people. But you sh- if you do that, you should apologise. You shouldn't, you know, uphold it as some sort of virtuous thing you're doing. Because what you're doing is you're, you're implementing a policy that only caters to the people within the boundaries of your nation. And what I found very disappointing in all of this is a complete lack of internationalism in the response. So locking down your country to prevent it from getting in, I think is a very nationalistic um, way of doing things. Um, and I don't understand why people have um, you know, been upheld as sort of paragons of virtue mm. for, for doing that. And then finally, the third thing with lockdown that people th- thought was possible was somehow to um, eliminate the virus. And, and that's, um, I think, quite That's not really possible, is it? It's just not possible. It's just not even practical. Now, I'm not saying, obviously, there are all sorts of nuances to this. Maybe there's a rationale for locking down for a short period of time that's sustainable um, over a particular period where the hospital's being overwhelmed, you know, to, to kind of buy some time on that to get more data. You know, there, there are reasons, obviously, to perhaps do it for a short period if it's something that doesn't harm the economically vulnerable um, to a large extent. So, so back uh, in the beginning of this year, when I heard about the outbreak in Wuhan, uh, I wanted to know what was going on. And in reading about it, it was very quickly it was obvious to me, as somebody who works with infectious disease outbreaks, that this would be a worldwide pandemic. This was not going to be able to contain it in in Wuhan or in Hubei okay. province. Uh, so that was just a matter of time how it was spread to the rest of the world. At the same time, I was only worried for about 10 minutes because uh, uh, I have three children, ages uh, 18, 4, and 4. And as a parent, all parents, we are mostly, the, the thing we are most concerned about is, of course, our children. Yes. So I read the numbers from Wu, and it was very clear from those numbers that my children were not at risk here. It was, okay. This was not a dangerous virus to the children, unlike the 1918 flu, which hit young people very harshly. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, that's, uh, so this is a terrible disease, but uh, the one thing that uh, we should appreciate is that it doesn't affect young people. It's very mild, not dangerous to young people. And I'm very grateful for that uh, because I know that my kids are not at risk from this. So if it would have been a, a different kind of virus, more flu-like virus, would your recommendations have been different than they are now? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, uh, so the basic recommendation of protecting the high risk would still have been there. But if the high risk population is different, then the recommendation would have been different. So if this was yeah. a virus that was basically very dangerous to children, then yeah, we would have, and which was spread a lot between children, then we would have had to protect the children. Mm. And that should be the focus then. Now the focus so should be protecting the old. If we had the Spanish flu back again now, we it would be perhaps reasonable to have lockdowns. Or uh, it would probably have been reasonable to, cl- to, to close schools, for example. That might yeah. very well have been reasonable to do. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's hard to say exactly what measures uh, it would be, but uh, uh, certainly they should have been different depending on, uh, on the nature of the pandemic. Yeah. And also uh, in influenza, I mean, in the annual influenza, the schools are actually a major uh, vector of spreading the disease, influenza. Mm. So that's, for example, why we try to vaccinate children because that can reduce the spread yeah. of the disease. But for COVID-19, is different. So schools are not a major vector or a major uh, conduit of uh, spreading this disease. 
They are locking down societies. They are closing schools. What is your explanation for all of this? That they are doing these, taking these measures, despite the fact that that you and so many other scientists and researchers know what's actually happening. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so back in, in March, there was a rationale to sort of flatten the curve so as not to overburden the hospitals. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I think that was a reasonable thing to do. And we, there was a lot of uncertainties. Uh, so, uh, uh, so to do a limited measures for a few weeks to flatten the curve so that not everybody has to go to the hospital at the same time um, I think that was reasonable, but for some reason, that somehow quietly just became a goal to suppress the virus, to, to suppress the disease, uh, which cannot be done. And there were many of us back in the spring said that you can do it temporarily, uh, but it's just going to come back with mm. the vengeance, which we are seeing <laughs> now. So what? What those of us who were sort of arguing against these harsh lockdowns um, back in the spring, what we were saying has not turned out to be true. And But uh, the politicians are just doubling down on the strategy that failed in the spring and trying the same failed strategy again. And it's you think it's prestige? Prestige or something? I'm a simple scientist. So yeah, it's, I, st- it's difficult for you I, to know, but... I, I am actually a stunned, and I don't understand it. Yeah. Because, I mean, all the pandemic preparedness plans were there and they were just ignored. 